thank you for joining us for Goop Book Club. Very excited to have you today. If you're new here, I'll give you our little spiel before we dive in. So every month we pick a book to read together. We have a Facebook group to chat all about it. We have a small Zoom discussions. We post reading guides and Q&As with our authors. And then the best part, of course, every month I get to show up here at the end and have a live chat with the author. Um, so as a reminder, we are live today. If there are any tech glitches, we apologize in advance. Uh, we'll do our best to avoid them. And you can send us in questions in real time. So in the chat box in YouTube, feel free to send in any questions for our guest of honor and the team will shoot them over to me and we'll answer as many as we can. And then per usual, at the end of the chat, I will be announcing our March Duke Book Club pick. So stay tuned for that. Um, so today I'm very grateful to be joined by the author of our February pick, The Orchard, David Hopin. David is currently a law student at Yale Law School. He just finished a full day of classes, so I told him we would avoid any legal questions. We'll give him a break on that front. Um, and The Orchard is his first novel, which is crazy impressive. So my friend Saya, who is the book's editor at EW, first turned me on to The Orchard. She has excellent taste in books, of course, and we both really appreciate a great coming of age story. And this is probably the biggest, most ambitious coming of age story that I've read in a really long time. What I love so much about The Orchard was how intimately David explores this feeling of youth, of having these burning desires, of feeling so curious, of falling in love for the first time, of getting your heart broken. Um, and at the same time, he built such a world that was so unfamiliar and exciting to me. So if you haven't read the book, it's about our main character, Ari Eden, who when he is about to be a senior in high school, his parents tell him that, him that they are leaving their small Orthodox Jewish community in Brooklyn and moving to a glitzy suburb of Miami. And there in Miami, Ari gets into some interesting trouble with a, with a group of friends. Um, so I'm excited to talk about this all with David today. So let's bring David on and, and give him a silent welcome for wh wherever you're, you're watching from today. Hi, Kiki. Hi David. <laughs> Thanks How for joining you? us today. Thanks I'm for having me. I'm good. How are you? How is I'm school? I'm doing well. I'm very excited to be here. Um, as we discussed before coming on, this is a fun uh, postscript to a long day of classes. So uh, I'm very excited to be here. Well, we appreciate it. I thought maybe you could start by telling a little bit about where did the idea for the orchard come from um, and how closely does it does it pick up on threads from your own childhood and from your from your own studies as as someone in our, our book club put it, they really want to know who you are in the story, who you identify with the most. So I thought that was an interesting question. Right. That That is often um, <laughs> the favorite question. But so I, The Orchard is a project um, on which I was at work for many years. I started outlining it when I was in high school, when I was a senior in high school. Um, it was... A project I was really excited about. I didn't see too many representations of this kind of world in fiction, um, certainly not the fiction um, to which I was exposed at that time. Uh, and so I was enjoying playing around with it, building these prehistoric notes. Uh, I went off to college and was at work on the book um, on my free time for the first two years. It was not something that I was um, pursuing formally. It was independent of my studies. Um, my junior year of college, I had the once in a lifetime opportunity to um, do a one on one tutorial with Susan Choi, the great Susan Choi, who was on um, staff at my college. And so that's when the book took on a new life in my mind. I, I felt as if this was something I wanted to see through to the next level. Um, I finished it by the time I graduated college. Um, and so that's kind of the long and short of the origin of this book and the genesis. Um, I don't know if I just disappeared for a second, but I think I'm back. Um, and in terms of who's whom, who am I in the book, the book uh, is entirely a work of fiction. It is not autobiographical, um, which is which is not to say that I didn't draw from certain important realities of, of the world I grew up in. Uh, I 
did grow up in a modern Orthodox Jewish world. I attended those kinds of schools that featured dual curriculum. So we're talking very long days that feature both prayer and ritual and um, biblical studies. And then students go flitting off to AP classes and basketball practice and, and um, very modern, contemporary, secular pursuits. Um, so I grew up in that kind of world grappling with what it was to have a sort of paradoxical identity. Um, so I drew from that and I drew from the sense of, of growing up in South Florida and enjoying the um, very wonderful, warm, literally warm communities. Um, so all of that kind of coalesced into the background of the project I was interested in writing, but the, the pyrotechnics of the story, I'm afraid, are not, um, are thankfully not real. Okay, that's fair enough. I, I'm i such a fan, too, of Susan Choi's Trust Exercise, and I, I, these books are so different, but I can see a way that you both have with exploring the relationships between young people that's so beautiful and so complex. So I, I, I love that you studied with her. One thing I'm curious about is because you were writing this book over a course of many years, and the book is so deep. There are so many layers to it. Like there are moments when Rabbi Feldman, there were scenes where he was teaching class and I felt like I was in class. Like I wanted to have a notebook and I was like, I'm learning so much. How, how many drafts did you have? Like logistically speaking, how did you, and were there parts of the book that you, that were cut and there, cause there's so many different layers to that. And were there different endings you considered or different layers that came out? Like what was for sort of your editing process like as you went? Yeah, this, this, this book is the result of many drafts. Um, I, I went through countless revisions at certain points, um, which, which I enjoyed. I mean, a lot of people say writing is is a work of labor, which it is, but I, I did enjoy seeing it grow uh, and being able to track, okay, this this existed, you know, several years ago when I was still in high school, it's still here now that I'm about to publish. I mean, it was really cool to see the progression of the book. And that way I worked with a fantastic, uh, brilliant editor, Sarah Birmingham at Echo. Uh, so I was very lucky in that, um, to have guidance in that regard. Um, but the, the curious thing is that a lot of the, a lot of the infrastructure and the overarching principles of the book and some of the the end games um, were there from the beginning. Uh, they, they were in that initial outline and, and somehow they uh, survived the final cut. So that part was also cool to see that things, a lot, a lot change your, you know, you hope as you grow up as a writer and as you work more, you sharpen your writing skills. Um, but at the same time, it was cool to see that the, what first, stood out to me when I when I was thinking about writing this book um, was still in the final product. Uh, that, that part was a lot of fun. Yeah, and I think what I was sort of thinking about with which character you were, something that I really identified with that I felt like was a central thesis and was something for a big piece of Ari was this pursuit of happiness. And I just want to read this passage it's on page 109 for everyone who's following along. And you told me how to pronounce this before. Gamara. Gamara. Yes. Gamara, Gamara, okay. Um, so this is on page 109. And this is actually from the essay that Ari writes to get into the school in Florida. So the Gamara's answer is emphatic. Dreaming of happiness is all important, even if you are not happy. Happiness shall elude you, and yet you shall pursue it. We never reach permanent happiness, but we move steadily after its shadow, both physically and spiritually. We creep closer and closer toward God, each time having the distance, but what we stand before is only an approximation. We move to new places, we visualize new achievements, but the yearning remains, because a life devoid of longing is not, in the eyes of the Talmud, a life fit for a human. And I thought that was so such a beautiful way of rather than of showing that the the beauty in happiness is not so much getting it but striving for it and I was wondering was that sort of something you thought about and wanted one of the big questions you were trying to answer in writing the book or what did you kind of think about that thank you yeah I, I actually am glad you picked that passage because that was 
probably my top uh, three or four most enjoyable scenes to write. I felt it distilled a lot of the underlying energy of the book, the philosophy of the book. Um, and I, I think it's one of the animating themes that certainly inherent in, in organized religion and Judaism, but also just um, for anyone in a modern sensibility. And then maybe th these kinds of things are rendered more acute now in the wake of COVID and changes in the American landscape. But I, I think there is a certain emphasis placed on, you know, enjoying the process has become a platitude now. But but I did strive in this book to think about some of the sources from the Western canon, from Bible, and, and just from everyday life um, that makes vivid that that kind of mentality can deepen perspectives, uh, can enrich your life, and losing sight of it oftentimes um, can have people, I don't know, steer, steer themselves wrong or do a disservice to them. Um, but I, I think it's something that we see Ari is fixated with from the very beginning. He wrote that essay when, even before he came to Florida, when he was still in Brooklyn and living basically in the company of books and teaching himself how to think and how to, how to pretend to experience things. And so I wanted it to be that the readers would recognize that, that that would be something that caught on in Ari's life um, early on, even before he moved to Florida and experienced uh, what he did. Yeah, and I love, I mean, I love the setup with Ari from the beginning where you, you, he's comparing how he feels to that Jane Kenyon poem. And he's, he's saying he wants to be re, re, to be retrieved by some force, any force that could reinsert me into my own life. And I just loved his sense of drama right from the beginning and how it was like he wanted something great and big to happen for him. And I, I really remember that feeling being young, being a teenager, and just being deprived, like almost being desperate for something like big and meaningful to happen. And he goes on this quest to find it and, and ultimately good and bad things come of that. But I loved, especially as a teen boy, I thought he was such a great character in, in that sense. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the one of the joys of this book is that although it's set in a very particular subculture, it's a religious community with which not everyone might be aware. The the storyline is universal. I, I, at least I hope. The the emotions that our experiences um, run the gamut, and these are these are the kinds of things that people look back on decades after high school and and think about how that time of your life when you're on the precipice of adulthood and even into your 20s, things seem as if they're the most important thing ever. And there's this desperate longing for things to be the most important thing ever. Um, so for me, it was, it was important to see Ari realize that. And also, I think what was interesting is to was to write characters who, if you take someone like Evan, uh, people in this book have experienced difficult things uh, that doesn't always give them a pass on the kinds of behavior that they exhibit or the consequences of their actions but but it does make it does make clear i think in some scenarios that there's not just the sense of like teenage irreverence or defiance um, that's consuming these characters as much as a real urgent sense of figuring out how to reorient your life around things like reverence and awe and wonder and so i, I wanted that feeling to permeate throughout the book and um, descend on the characters in, in their own unique ways. And I think there was a real respect at a young age for grief and for loss and for trauma and how that shapes a young person, especially like Evan, for instance, um, that really did come through. And I think there are those passages where Ari is even considering, you know, is it Evan's loss that almost it, it added to his beauty in a way. Um, and that was obviously a complicated relationship and a complicated thing. And Evan didn't always have a channel for that grief or for that loss, but he was really striving in a lot of ways to, to fill a hole in his life, like so many of us are. Yeah, I think in, in the wake of some of the losses that characters endure, for instance, Evan, uh, who, who experiences a pretty fundamental loss, there's this sense of not only now what happens, how do you fill your life? And and some of the characters look to books and some of them look to religion and some of them look to everything in between or maybe everything far away from that. Uh, you know, there, there's also this awareness within other characters that this is perhaps what gives you 
a sharpened sense of importance. This is what lends tragic grandeur. Um, books that explored tragic grandeur were things that I loved reading about when I was when I was young, when I first started writing this book. And I think these are some of the great big books that we have um, grapple with those kind of questions. And so that, that was something that I, I consciously was thinking through as I was working on these characters. And why was it that being a tragic figure lended you some kind of aura? And why was it that that made you a leader or caught the eye of people uh, who surrounded you? Yeah, and maybe we can talk a little bit about the legend of the four rabbis, because that to me was so fascinating. And I, when we had our Zoom with our book club members the other day, that was another one of the passages that we talked about. This is on page 225, when Rabbi Feldman is sort of wrapping up trying to explain what's what's the point of this story and he says which is to say never lose sight of the grander depth but at the same time it also reinforces an equally critical lesson don't chase too obsessively after those higher realms don't discard the smaller but equally vital parts of judaism in favor of supernatural myths because without our basic rituals and customs and structures without our daily love for and connection to hashem we are left with nothing but blind vision and of course, Evan didn't like that answer, but I love that answer. <laughs> Can you I'm talk glad. a little bit about how you came to know about the, the story of the four rabbis? And we were also trying to do some detective work in our in our group chat the other day in terms of were we meant to think of each character as following in one of these paths of, of the rabbis? So maybe you could speak a little to that. Right. Um one of the funny products of growing up in the kind of community I grew up in and attending the kind of schools I attended is that you are exposed to this spectacular collection of myths and legends um, in a religious context and in an educational context to the extent that you arrive at a certain age in your life and you can draw from this pretty wonderful depository of stories without realizing that these are exceptional stories. They're the kinds of myths you grow up with, you know, the way you would grow up with um, any kind of, I don't want to say fairy tale, but any kind of like, you know, uber, uber myth or founding, um, founding legend. And so I remember in high school when I was thinking about this book, I, 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 that myth kind of revisited me and I was thinking about how could I repurpose that story? Um, I, I think it encompassed a lot of the, the big questions, uh, in religion, in life, and growing up, um, and, and, and just being a member of, you know, a, a productive member of a civic society. So it was fun to think about that legend taking a step back from it. I don't know the first time I learned about it when I was a kid, but I but I did have a have a stretch of like consciously reimagining it when I was 17 or 18 and, and working on the book. Um, and so, I, I mean, as you picked up, it, it, it thinks about perspective. It thinks about what happens when you approach religiosity from a, a granular perspective and think about fun, you know, fundamental little nuanced rituals that fill your day. And also when you can zoom out and think, what's the big picture here? How, does, how do I find fulfillment in life by doing these kinds of things? And so th I think that story more than others really hits home in that regard. And, and it's something I think about a lot, um, even in the context of a law school now. Um, you can substitute religion in, in that equation for law and think about when you, when you are following the, you know, small scale everyday norms of the law, you're contributing to a society that functions well. When you zoom out and think about, okay, why do you stop at, you know, traffic lights in, in, in the middle of the night when there's no one around, maybe because there's some greater expression of human fulfillment that we're placing into law. Um, I mean, that that kind of like ability to, to toggle back and forth was is something I think about a lot and it's something I think is crucial to the book. In terms of who's whom, the analog game, it, it uh, I admit it was intentional to throw a bit of a curveball. There are five or arguably five character main characters uh, with, within this study group, um, in this band of, of misfits at least. Um, and there are four rabbis in the in the founding myth and so I, I leave it to readers to have fun thinking about what fits nicely with 
which uh, which model of, of rabbinical authority and who suffers which fate and which character should we look up to, which character should we uh, maybe distance ourselves from sympathizing with, uh, and so on and so forth. Yeah, one thing that I appreciated was that there was an ambiguity, especially when it, I mean, the, the myth is a little bit more clear the way that Rabbi Solomon presents it in terms of who is rewarded for certain behaviors. But what I really appreciated was that the book wasn't saying that that practicing your religion in this way will lead you to happiness and practicing it, your faith in this way won't lead you to happiness because each character really had a different experience in what was right for them. And I think I loved the, the end of the book when it comes back around and Ari goes to visit his childhood friend and he's kind of taken aback by the happiness that his friend has found in this very rich community. So it wasn't saying, you know, if you live, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a criticism of any one way of going about your faith, which I really appreciated because I think sometimes in stories, even if it's not meant to be that way, it, it ends up feeling that way. But I felt like here the morals were, were stretched in different ways with different characters. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that because the book very much does not function, or at least it's not aimed to function as a critique of any sort. If anything, I, I think it does explore some of the meaningful and lasting parts of um, these kinds of communities, both the ones from which Ari came originally, the one in Ari uh, ends up in when he's transplanted to Florida. Um, but it also emphasizes that there's, there is no one formula for happiness and for meaning. Uh, it's something I think Rabbi Bloom emphasizes in these in these group meetings um and again i, I enjoy the ambiguity of leaving it to readers to decide you know to what degree rabbi bloom did a, a competent job of instilling that kind of recognition in, in the group um but yeah i mean I, I think that the kinds of worlds that ari dabbles in and, and the kind of world that the readers here are exposed to um are complicated worlds and there's there are you know, different gradients and different ways of, of coming, arriving at a place that you can call home and arriving at a place where you feel comfortable with your, your place in the world and, and figuring out where you belong. And so, especially in the context of being a teenage, a teenager and, and people in this book, figuring out where do they belong? Um, I think it's important for, to have that recognition in your life that uh, there are, there are multiple ways of fulfilling it. Yeah. And I'm glad you just brought up Rabbi Feldman because he was someone who came up as a complicated character in our book club Zoom. And he wasn't someone that I had, I hadn't thought about this till someone in our book club verbalized it. But, you know, he was flawed as a teacher, of course. And he, he didn't maybe necessarily make the best choices for Evan and for Ari, but it was like he had this master plan. But I had to remind myself like, oh, all of these lessons that he was teaching, he had a very specific point of view as well. And that didn't necessarily make it right or wrong, but I just think it's interesting because it adds this other layer of complexity in terms of how this, how the boys ended up trying to make sense of what he was teaching them and how they tried to rebel against it. Cause he kind of set up almost in a way this, this game for them that, that they took many, many steps further, but he, he was a part of it too, as in, and he's an adult. Right. So Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Feldman is a different rabbi in the school. Rabbi Bloom is, is the, the ringleader. Oh, sorry. So, rabbi Bloom. Rabbi Bloom. Rabbi Feldman is also one of my favorites. So that works. But so Rabbi, <laughs> rabbi Bloom, he, he, you're right. He is a complicated character. And it, you know, wh one of the cool things about this process of, of publishing book, a, a book and meeting with and hearing from readers from all across the spectrum is um, gaining some insight into how people perceive other characters and different reactions. And so I've seen, I've seen readers who are head over heels for Rabbi Bloom and, and sympathize with the, the purity of his project and the way he inspired the students to think deeply and, um, have a sense of, have a sense that Rabbi Bloom wasn't responsible ultimately for what happened. And then I've seen readers who take, you know, the opposite approach and think that Rabbi Bloom inevitably was meddling in lives and you know pushing boundaries that he should not have been playing with uh, and, and was a manipulator and so 
I think there's room for, for both views. And I think there's a lot of, you know, gray in between the two poles there. Um, I think what was interesting is to see how over the course of the novel, Rabbi Bloom first emerged as this sort of, you know, ideal role model for someone like Ari, who was desperate for learning and hungry to be taught the great works and the great lessons in life. And Rabbi Bloom emerged as this figure that he had, you know, basically dreamt up and sitting alone in a library in Brooklyn. And then we see Rabbi Bloom has his own agenda insofar as he had a previous life as an academic before going into um, rabbinical education and all of those different, all of those different um, strains within Rabbi Bloom, you know, bubble to the surface as he basically identifies two, two experiments for himself, two moral experiments in Ari and in Evan. And uh, he, he does push boundaries, uh, but I think it would be oversimplified or reductive to say that he does it solely just to see what happens. I think Rabbi Bloom does does care. Uh, and so there there is that funny sense of figuring out what to make of these kinds of characters who have dueling ambitions and can be read in two different lights. No, that's a beautiful way of putting it. The other characters I want to talk about, and we have a reader question about this, but is the girls in the book. And Ari and Sophia, those were the passages that, to me, I just loved so much. I underlined so many. And Julianne in her book club, there's, I think it's the moment when they're they're out. Um, it's, I think, early on in the book. And Ari uses the term vanilla sparkle to describe so Sophia. And Julianne said, if someone just describes me as vanilla sparkle i could just die like happy that that would be the end and there really were these these moments that captured this teenage love and desire and how ari just saw sophia as this 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 strong bright magnet um and i'm, I'm curious one how you thought about developing their relationship i also thought it was really interesting that in their physically intimate scenes it went so far, but then it stopped. And I wondered how you thought about just creating their relationship and their dynamic. Um, and then I'll, I'll get to our, our reader question. Cool, yeah, thank you. Um, and I like that that vanilla um, <laughs> analysis. Um, I have to, I have to, I should, I have to thank both my parents because they were, they're my original editors and in particular, uh, my mom um, supported that line. And so I know she's getting a kick out of hearing that probably watching this from home. Um, I loved writing Sophia. I thought she was was probably the most dynamic and the richest character uh, dreamt up in this world. I, I enjoyed seeing how Sophia was undergoing her own, I don't know, uh, transformation almost uh, throughout the course of the story. And in many ways, it, it occurred behind the scenes. Um, I think that Sophia was not only someone who formed this archetypal muse for Ari and someone who, who pushed Ari intellectually and someone against whom Ari realized oftentimes he could not measure up. Uh, Sophia was this, was this bright light in many ways during the course of the story, um, representing not only to Ari, but I think to, to any readers, what, what this world could produce in the richest sense. Um, someone who is intellectually engaged and someone who is... Um, impressive and uh, dedicated to music, um, or, or that is to say, to dedicate it to some art or some higher passion. Um, and so I, I think Sophia was a leader in the book and someone I just had a, had a great time writing. I, I think that she, when we talk about tragic grandeur and aura, uh, it was fun to distill that kind of sensibility and, and mythic quality into a character. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I'm missing a last part of what you said before, but this this might be where the law school exhaustion comes in. I was curious about the physical intimacy oh, right, between intimacy. them That's and right. how you thought about writing them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I. Yeah. So that was a conscious decision as I as I was writing the book to create this sense of um, create the sense of energy and friction and um, mystique, and then have things exit off stage. Um, I 
I thought that it's it, it set a certain standard in the book. Um, th there's a certain like whispering quality I wanted in the book, and I think that that did heighten it. Um, I also think that seeing Ari's a lot of Ari's um, romantic involvements do operate in that function. I think I think adds to a little sense of ambiguity throughout the book and people trying to keep track of where Ari is in his outlook on the world and his social interactions. I, I thought that was all. Um, I thought that was all important and it felt right when I was writing it. Sometimes you write things and they click and sometimes you write other things and think, okay, I have to go back to the drawing board and rework that and rearrange how it looks. But the, the mechanics of it, for lack of a better word, uh, felt natural. It felt like that was the, the most logical and, and truest form of, I don't know, writing the story and writing how Ari would conceptualize it. That's how I felt. I felt like if Ari was telling this story, almost partly out of respect, this is the way he would have told it. And I also love that you use the stage analogy of off stage because the book had a play like quality to me. I could see a lot of the, the scenes unfolding and then sort of like the scene ending and it's like the curtain closing. So I, I like that you you said that. Um, so Melinda asked, where do you imagine that some of the girl characters now women are now. Do, do you ever let yourself think about any of these characters and, and where some of them might be? I do. I The the earlier versions of the novel, um, to maintain the, the, the stage analogy, gave, gave somewhat of a more thorough peek behind the curtains uh, in the epilogue, um, where people might be, if you fast forward to several years, I ended up scaling Scaling that back a bit, which I was glad I did, because I, I think it did. It was important to have a very concise and efficient uh, epilogue for for a number of reasons. Um, but since that exercise of scaling back, I, I I've tried to consciously not dwell on that and think about where people ended up. Um, I, you know, particularly in the case of Sophia, I, I I won't comment on that because I think a lot of the fun of the ending, um, if you can call it fun is that there are certain questions that are lingering about where, where people are. Um, but I mean, in, in terms of the most stable character in the book, uh, I think in, in giving Amir a run for his money would be Kayla. And so I think it's, I think it's fun to imagine where Kayla might have ended up. Um, Kayla, who was someone who was very self-sufficient and driven um, and capable of rooting her ambition outside of the lot, a lot of the vices and a lot of the, for lack of a better word, suffering that consumes her peers. Uh, so I, I think, I think I, I do think that of all the characters I imagine in the future, I oftentimes will imagine where Kayla ends up and the kind of career Kayla ends up building and what Kayla thinks about in terms of um, having enough moral courage in a, a pivotal stretch of her life to avoid a lot of the pitfalls that other characters experienced. Um, so if I had, if I had to pick one character, it probably would be Kayla when I think about that. That's interesting. I think too, like I've been asking so many heavy questions, but Kayla was such a funny character in some ways, like her, her exchanges with Ari were often very funny. And I think, um, I mean, Oliver, like there was many, and now I'm just thinking of like funny lines. It's like when Oliver was like donating to the like the clothing fund for Ari, like God bless his soul <laughs> type of thing. There were so many great moments like that, that, that were really endearing and really sweet. I'm also thinking of the, the tutor who was like such a on like cloud nine and was not helping Ari at all. So that's interesting. I think the other character, the, other girl character that I still think about is Rebecca. And I liked how at the end, Rebecca didn't let Ari off the hook. And that was sad and that was hard to see, but she, I thought it was so true to who I imagined she would be as a character. And also showing that Ari wasn't necessarily innocent in everything that, that had played out either. Um, and I think it was such a tribute to Noah that, that she hadn't made, made peace with, with what had happened. So I like that you made that choice. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think Noah fittingly receives a lot of the credit for in, ingratiating Ari into this world and, and being a, a decent and kind person and role model in many ways for Ari. But, but it's, 
It's important to remember that in the in opening scenes in which Ari is exposed to this group of friends, Rebecca is also also very much a driving force in this. Um, Rebecca is someone who makes an effort to include Ari, even in you know little comments here and there in the beginning scenes. And so it was it was emotional even for me when I was thinking of you know when I wrote that scene uh, the last time Ari and Rebecca interact and Rebecca does not let him off the hook, try as she might, and even though she has that instinct to think of Ari only in a more generous light, uh, to, to have that kind of full circle moment for Ari where he's standing somewhat cluelessly in the beginning and bubbling his way through something um, and just at lost and adrift in the world. And, and in the end, when he's adrift, maybe in other ways um, and having a rather different conversation with Rebecca. Yeah, and I loved, I loved his friendship with Noah. And I thought one thing that I tried to think about was at the end of the book, I'm like, okay, what, what drew Noah to Ari? And someone in our book club Zoom brought up that conversation that they had. I think it's after Ari sees Noah play, play basketball for the first time. And of course, Noah is the, the golden boy of the basketball team. And they, they get in the car and Ari goes to say like, oh my gosh, you're really good. And Noah just goes, I don't want to hear that from you. And I thought that was interesting because it was, Noah was also getting something out of his relationship with Ari that he wasn't necessarily getting with other people who had known him for so long. So, and I thought you did a nice job of showing that with, with each relationship, what was kind of drawing one to the other because they were unexpected friendships in some ways. Yeah, and I think that it's not to say that the other characters didn't provide for Noah uh, a, a sounding board or, a, or a, a comfortable space to just be genuine and be yourself. But Ari, I think his reputation w was such within the group uh, that he served this, as this kind of, I don't know, source of moral clarity, the source of um, this sense of being apart from any of the trappings of their eliteness or of their ambitions or of their kind of particularities of their childhood, Ari was this refreshing light. And so, um, you know, the, it, it's easy for readers, I think, to see why Ari would have been, you know, gravitating towards Noah. But also, I think, and I hope that it, it comes clear that Ari wasn't, Ari a lot of times has this habit of or maybe compulsion to conceive of himself as this blank slate and as this person kind of drifting through the world and, and figuring out where he belongs. But a lot of times we have little moments in the book where Ari gets a sense of how he almost can see his reflection through the eyes of other people. And so he, there are, there are moments, uh, especially with Noah, that it becomes clear that Ari, Ari does serve a, a sort of real social utility. Ari does help some of the characters think through things and cope with loss and with some of the natural and unnatural changes that go on throughout the book. Uh, and so for Noah, and in Noah's mind, Ari very much is that sense of, uh, that, that source of, of clarity and uh, comfort. Yeah, totally. Um, before I let you go, I have to ask you, what are what are you working on next? Will there Fair be question. a next book? Um, <laughs> yeah, so my, my immediate future is that I owe an essay tomorrow night. Um, but after I do that, I, I'm at work on another book. Um, and I don't know, I, I guess I have to be careful how I what I say, but we're we're working on some other exciting um, opportunities and uh, other mediums. Uh, so though, yeah, exciting exciting times ahead, hopefully. Well, that's so exciting. Thank you for being with us all month and for being with us today. I really, really appreciate it. And if anyone has not read the Orchard yet, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, go get it from your local bookstore. And David, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kiki. I'm very grateful for this. Thank you. Yeah, I'll talk to you soon. And everyone else can stay on. I'm going to announce our next book. So for March, we are reading Sorrow and Bliss by Meg Mason. I am so thrilled about this one. So this was another personal recommendation for me. My old boss and one of my favorite people, Christine Pride, recommended this book to me. She actually has a novel coming out in October. Um, and this is a modern love story. It's 
dark and funny, sharp and tender, um, hopeful, just all of the feels. And it has a brooding Sally Rooney vibe going on. And I love a brooding Sally Rooney vibe. Um, this explores, though, a slightly older and more mature slice of life. The inner monologue of these characters is just fantastic. The type of thing where the characters are saying the things that you're like, I thought I was the only person who thought that in my head. Uh, the chemistry between characters is so good. So the book revolves around an on again, off again relationship between Martha, who's our main character, who is extremely witty, and her very charismatic husband, Patrick. Um, and they meet as um, young kids, they're, they're teens. And it happens at a very pivotal moment in Martha's life. The first time she experiences a, a darkness where she finds herself having trouble to get out of bed, not being able to laugh. Um, and she doesn't know what to make of it. And, and that's when Patrick comes into her life. And when the book opens, Martha is 40 and they are seemingly perhaps at the end of their marriage or maybe not. So you have to read the book to find out. Um, and I hope you'll read along with us all month and join us back here. Yeah, for our next chat. You can find all of the info at goop.com slash goop book club. And thank you so much for joining today and hope to talk to you guys soon. All right. Bye.